Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Runway. Berto is your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We are going to have a great show for you today. Today is going to be a special show because it's going to be filled up with outtakes. Because after reading an article title, well, I tell you what, let's go ahead and just get busy with the show. But I want to reassure everybody of one thing. In as much of the tit- as the title of the show, positive affirmations is what I want to give. You know, there is a time that you must come to a catharsis. There is a time that you must tell yourself things are bad, things are going to get worse, but we can, in things getting worse, we can look down that tunnel and we can say, you know what I see though? Things are going to be better. And in looking down that tunnel, As bad as things are today, I am superbly positive of our ultimate outcome. As bad as things are today, I repeat, I am extraordinarily positive as to where we are going to be going, as to how we are going to progress as a country, because I think If we do what we are supposed to do, if we play our cards right, we would have come out of this thing growing, but growing in a manner that says we are revolutionizing this economy, we are revolutionizing this country, we are going to take the power away from those who have usurped it from us. So in as much as we have the title of the show today that's sort of dim and grim, rest assured it's just a shock that I'm hoping to impend, impose on those who first see the title with the expectation that going forward, we are going to make a change For the positive, and I'm not talking about hope and change. I think the problem with hope and change was the word hope. And I know a lot of times people have a tendency to want to have hope. Welcome aboard, Brother Pillard. I know people like to hear the word hope. As far as I am concerned, hope can actually be a dangerous word. And why can hope be a dangerous word? Because hope can mean that we don't have the resolve to do it, but that the expectation is that it will miraculously happen. Nothing miraculously happens. Those of us who have lived for a very long time know very well that you don't have change that just happens. You make change happen. Those of you that are just joining us, I ask you so kindly to please go ahead and share our program right now. I ask you so kindly to share it on your threads, on your, your, your pages, your walls, everything. If you really want to help us make a difference, the only way we make a difference is if all of us work together. And that's what it's all about. That is what it's all about. Anyhow, title of the show today is, Is America Now the Nation to be Pitied? Pity party time? You be the judge. We must finally start pondering several writers who wonder out loud if it is time to pity America. These outtakes make the answer clear. And of course, we're going to go through updates. At some point, one reaches rock bottom. It is clear to many that COVID-19 may be the straw that puts us into pity party time. Pity party time. Eugene Robinson's article, The United States is a country to be pitied, should be a wake-up call to many. Many of our peers around the world has held us, have held us up to a silent pity for some time. And the reason I say a silent pity, right, is because nobody with a Trump in power can say, oh, you poor things, you poor Americans. Nobody can say that 
because Trump would come with a vengeance. And in as much as we should be pitied in a lot of, in the choices that we've made and the results that we've had, in as much as that is the truth, Trump still has the power of a financial system run in dollars. He still has the power of a country who runs the world's financial structures. And as much as many other countries on the back end are trying to themselves to be that sovereign currency of choice throughout the country, but it's not yet realized. But they are, in effect, doing it as we sleep. China is, in effect, in Africa. China is, in effect, in South America. China is, in effect, in the Caribbean. China is, in effect, in Central America. So is Russia in many other places. So is Brazil. So as we... As we continue our decline, the fight is going to be who is going to be the one taking over. And I spoke to a young woman today that I'll be playing tomorrow as I process the video. This is a young 22, 23-year-old who went to Cameroon and spent some time on a Fulbright scholarship learning about the ills that's occurring in the country and helping out, etc., but realizing not from an American perspective, being here in America, only understanding things from an American perspective, but being overseas and seeing what is happening, then she can also realize that yes, colonialism, patriarchy, capitalism, and all these isms and the ills that they've informed throughout the world, hmm, the days may be lagging. And the thing about it is that Donald Trump is one of the helpers to help mitigate its further and quickest and faster demise. So, Eugene Robinson's article, The United States is a Country to be Pitted, should be a wake-up call to many. Many of our peers around the world has held us up to a silent pity for some time. How could the country that professes to be the leader of the world set itself on a path of self-destruction? How? It's by design. It's by design. As a country in ascent, as a country that's getting more intelligent, as a country with the people becoming more progressive, asking the real questions, yeah, we're going to talk about remedies too, Kathy. Talking about, uh, as we talk about, as we got intelligent, those in the know, those folks that control an unfair economy, those that have controlled the capital unduly so, those undeservings, had to figure out a way. How? How are we going to mitigate this? How is this unfairness to people who are becoming intelligent? How can we do it? You, you know what you do? You get people less intelligent. And that is what we have been on a 30, 40, a 40 year. We have been on a 40 year set of metrics to make America dumber. And we have successfully done some so with so many. And dumber doesn't mean intellectually dumb because all most people are smart. Most people intellectually are sound. What it is all about, though, is creating narratives that messes with the intricacies of the mind, a mind that can be controlled because it is nothing more than the intricacies of connectivity. And if you go ahead and short circuit areas and if you go ahead and adjust other areas that have nothing to do with intellect but the carnal of who we are, human beings but animals, you get control. So those of you who, uh, uh, who have been the most susceptible to the carnality of who we are controlled by that gray matter that is sort of ancient... It's not a fast, as fast as computers, though it's interconnection, it's, it's parallelism, allows for more intricate thinking, can be short-circuited under certain, certain conditions, which is what's been done to a lot of Americans. So, in that light, I want 
for all these little outtakes of old, not old, but some from previous shows that I've done, from some new stuff that I'm adding, it's a mixture of about 10 things. I want us to, together, just think about what's happening. Think about this path. And then, at the end, let's talk about, but how the hell do we get out of this? And I tell you what, folks, like I said, I am happy. I am happy. I am very happy. Because coronavirus bring, brought us down so low. So low. The depression that's subsequently coming is going to put us in such a dilemma that that tipping point is going to be more drastic. And I think more of us are going to discover our own humanity. I honestly think we are going to discover what make, made us real human because the suffering we are going to see, we are going to internalize that suffering and say, I don't want that to be me. For it not to be me, it cannot be you. And when we start doing that, I mean, there, in as much as I'm a humanist, there are a lot of phrases in the Bible that make sense. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? Because if you don't, they, must, they may do unto you what you don't want done unto you. So let's get busy. I want to start with a, uh, with, to show you an illustration of the type of presidency we have. And I've done this cut before for our old timers. So bear with me. We have new and old cuts in here. So let's start out with this one here and we'll take it on the other side. Retail sales are crashing. Jobs are being lost by the millions, over 33, 36 million people out of work. All of this because of the coronavirus, all of this because of our response, not our response, but the president response, our pathetic response, derelict of duty type response to the coronavirus. Well, now that he's in pain, now that he's seen that he is in trouble, he needs Americans to go back to work at all costs, even if it means that a certain percentage of them will die. I want you to listen to what a dictator sounds like. I want you to listen to what a strong man sounds like. I want you to listen to what this guy is attempting. And if we buy it, if we allow those people that continue to adore and worship this guy, this is where we're heading. Check this out and listen to the tonality of the president's news conference today. I just want to make something clear. It's very important. Vaccine or no vaccine, we're back. And we're starting the process. I just want to make something clear. It's very important. Vaccine or no vaccine, we're back. And we're starting the process. And in many cases, they don't have vaccines. And a virus or a flu comes, and you fight through it. We haven't seen anything like this in a hundred and some odd years, 1917. But you fight through it. And people sometimes, I guess, we don't know exactly yet, but it looks like they become immune, or at least for a short while and maybe for life. But you fight through it. Many of us have lost friends. We read about that and we see that and that's what the news covers. But uh, a very, very small, that's a very small percentage. It's a very, very small percentage. I say it all the time. It's a tiny percentage. That's a very small percentage. It's a very, very small percentage. I say it all the time. It's a tiny percentage. This guy cares nothing about you. Even those people that adore him. He cares nothing about you. When he found out that somebody close to him may have had the coronavirus, he went into a panic. He still doesn't want to destroy his, his image. He still is not wearing the mask. But everybody now around him, put the mask on if you're going to be too close. Or we better make absolutely sure you don't have the coronavirus. These guys, they don't care. If you doubt it, take a look at that. even Fox News. The Fox News have been begging you. They have been imploring to you. They have been telling you to go to work. Go to work. We don't want anybody staying home and because this is no big deal. But guess what? Fox News staffers will continue working from home through mid-June according to the memo. Fox News doesn't really care about you either. They're keeping their stars at home. They're keeping their stars protected. All they have to do is get into a cab or get into a limousine and go into work. But will they do that? 
oh no, they must be protected. So why aren't we protecting you? Why aren't we giving you hazard pay? In as much as we have those grocery store workers working their butts off to serve us. I came across this notice uh, from Kurt Eichenwall. Let me go ahead and show you that. Where he says, a Kroger employee died of COVID-19 on, uh, on day it announced it would be cutting employees' pay by $2 an hour. And shortly after, it reported a massive increase in sale. The CEO received $12 million last year. Until Kroger pays employees for risking their lives, no one should really shop there. Now, question, folks. I wrote as a lead to that. Let this sink in. This is why I do what I do. Not because you can means you should. That is why we need a completely transformed economic system. Let's not let those who died in the COVID-19 pandemic to have done so in vain for a system that ultimately killed them. And yes, ultimately, all the dead is, is a direct or indirect result of our system and the fraudsters who run it. It is not incompetence. It is deliberate. Understand what's happening in this country and let's make sure to react accordingly. Let's make sure to vote accordingly. Now, if anybody doubts that is deliberate, if anybody doubts, just needs to listen to whom again? Rick Bright, who was where? On the inside. And here it is. I believe Americans need to be told the truth. I believe that the best scientific guidance and advice was not being conveyed to the American public during that time. I believe by not telling America the truth or being fully transparent, regardless of where the information was coming from, um, people were not as prepared as they could have been and should have been. We did not forewarn people. We did not train people. We did not educate them on social distancing and, and, and wearing a mask as we should have in January and February. All of those forewarnings, all those educational opportunities for the American public could have had an impact on further slowing this outbreak. Yes, yes, it would have slowed the outbreak. But you know what? Uh, what we have to take into account is we have two poles, right? Two polls out there. You have those. You have those that are being sensible and telling you stuff. Then you have those that are trying to mislead. The only way around that is to always have the pushback, whether you're on the inside in the administration or whether you're on the outside of the administration. It's about the pushback. It's about the pushback, and that's why this Tony Fauci pushback at the hearing was so so damn. Powerful. I want you to check this out and we'll take it on. We're opening up a lot of economies around the, around the U.S. And I hope that people who are predicting doom and gloom and say, oh, we can't do this, there's going to be a surge, will admit that they were wrong if there isn't a surge. Because I think that's what's going to happen. In rural states, we never really reached any sort of pandemic levels in Kentucky and other states. We have less deaths in Kentucky than we have in, a, in, an, in an average flu season. So I think we ought to have a, a little bit of humility in, in our uh, belief that we know what's best for the economy. And as much as I respect you, Dr. Fauci, I don't think you're the end all. I don't think you're the one person that gets to make a decision. We can listen to your advice, but there are people on the other side saying there's not going to be a surge and that we can safely open the economy. And the facts will bear this out. First of all, uh, Senator Paul, thank you for your comments. I, I have never made myself out to be the end all and only voice in this. I'm a scientist, a physician and a public health official. I give advice according to the best scientific evidence. There are a number of other people who come into that and give advice that are more related to the things that you spoke about, about the need to get the country back open again and economically. I don't give advice about economic things. I don't give advice about anything other than public health. So I wanted to respond to that. The second thing is that you use the word we should be humble about what we don't know. And I think that falls under the fact that we don't know everything about this virus. And we really better be very careful, particularly when it comes to children, because the more and more we learn, we're seeing things about what this virus can do that we didn't see from the studies in China or in Europe. For example, right now, children presenting with COVID-19 COVID who actually have a very strange inflammatory syndrome, very similar to Kawasaki syndrome. 
I think we better be careful if we are not cavalier in thinking that children are completely immune to the deleterious effects. So again, you're right in the numbers that children in general do much, much better than adults and the elderly and particularly those with underlying conditions. But I am very careful and hopefully humble in knowing that I don't know everything about this disease. And that's why I'm very reserved in making broad predictions. Now, uh, so that good for us. We have pushed back beforehand. Let me go ahead and salute all the wonderful listeners I have here. Uh, Bruce Pol uh, that, that are on the chat room. I know there are many others elsewhere, but if you want to be acknowledged, just come on to the chat either on YouTube or on our page, facebook.com slash politics done right. On YouTube, it's youtube.com slash Egberto Willis. Folks, by the way, I want to ask you all, please go ahead and like the page, uh, politi uh, uh, facebook.com slash politics done right. And also go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash slash uh, youtube.com slash Egberto Willies. And of course, hey, go ahead and follow me on Twitter. Anyhow, welcome aboard, Bruce Pollard. Welcome aboard, Lee Grant, Norman Reynolds. Uh, uh, let's see who else is here. We have Kathy Courtney. We also have... Uh, Para ver, para ver, para ver. Mary Wood, welcome aboard. And of course, Susan Sharko. Muchísimas gracias por todos que están aquí. Thank you so kindly for all those that are here. Please do remember, share, share, share. I want to ask you so kindly to make sure to share. If you're listening to this on podcast, please share the podcast. Let's let everybody know about what's really happening in the country and the positive nature of the change we intend to make. So please share our podcast wherever you're on Stitcher or iTunes tunes or wherever you are uh tune in whatever as well as if you're on facebook please go ahead and share us on your wall on your pages if you're on twitter please share our youtube link on twitter or facebook link on twitter and if you're on youtube please tell others about us and share us as well anyhow the next piece that i want to play you guys okay is from eugene robinson and when i saw this i got a pit in the stomach because as opposed to being a I thought Eugene was a bit stoic but uh, depressed. I don't want to take that attitude after we listen to it. I want to take a more uh, positive attitude. So let's go ahead and listen to that and then we'll move on from there. The United States right now is a nation to be pitied, and, and I think it is. And I, I don't see how, what other attitude you could you could have if you were if you're in, say, South Korea, for example, a nation that 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 the United States helped rise from the rubble of war, um, a nation that has. A, a developed nation has a per capita GDP of still just about half that of the United States has always looked up to the United States as a model of democracy, of governance, of science and technology. The, the, the virus came to both countries, South Korea and the United States, on the very same day, January, January 20th. Same virus, same day. Uh, the United States has now had more than 87,000 deaths. And in South Korea, they have had 260 deaths, 260. Um, and, and, and so how, how could you look at, at your sort of big brother, the United States, with anything other than, than, than pity at, at, the, at the, the, the erratic, insane, frankly, leadership we have now? Um, and, and the way um, we're not showing the kind of social cohesion. Fortunately, as you said, most Americans are, are you know, are, are, are looking at this more sensibly, but, but uh, you know, the president is, is trying to lessen our social cohesion rather than, than enhance it, and he shows no compassion, no competence. Uh, it is, uh, it's a disaster um, for the United States to be in this position. We're, there are a few nations that have handled this crisis worse than us, but not many, a handful. Everybody else has done better, and that is just shocking. We are in a state of accelerating degeneracy in this country. We have never been as a country so weak as we are now, so pitied by our friends around the world, so cheered on by our adversaries as we decline. And there's no other way to put it. The response has been as insane. It's asinine. During the Second World War, General Marshall had a quote, and he said, by the, by the time the war is over, 
Our flag will be known around the world on the one hand as a force for overwhelming strength and on the other hand, a force for freedom. You know, Donald Trump has stepped back from the assertion of American values, the defense of democracy and liberty for years. And now when we look at this virus, we see every day just plain old fashioned imbecility, asininity, foolishness in the extreme coming from the podium emblazoned with the seal of the president of the United States. And this COVID-19 virus, this is the epicenter of it, the United States of America. There are more deaths. It's the country where you have the greatest likelihood of dying from it in the future. Our response as a country has been an embarrassment. And this moment of American weakness will take a long time if we're able to recover from it. And that's what this election in November fundamentally is about. It's going to be a decision whether we put the throttle down in our national decline and steepen the dive and go faster, or we try to come back from it. But, but certainly, Donald Trump has demonstrated over these months an incapacity at every conceivable level for leadership of a nation as great as ours. So true, so true, so true. Welcome, uh, Christine Anderson says, hey, Eugene, Orangeburg in the house. You're right. America has lost whatever leadership it has in the world. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, um, you know, Michael Steele, former, uh, former chairman of the Republican Party, had much to say as well. And the, the reason I like to play uh, Michael Steele is because in, in as much as the party had had many ups and downs, and in, in as much as it had wronged M Michael Steele, he has been a solid Republican that was willing to challenge the party. And here he is. The fact that we are in the middle of a national pandemic, uh, which is part of a global pandemic, uh, and our political leadership uh, only, only play is to politicize this, uh, is, is beyond unfortunate. Um, people are going to get sick again. People are going to uh, die from some of these decisions that are being made. And, and that's not hyperbole. I mean, we're already beginning to see in, in countries that have even, you know, cautiously reopened, um, a, a new spike level uh, has emerged. You have our own scientists and doctors, Andrea, who are telling us, don't do this the way you're planning to do it. You just can't you know, precipitously open up your county or your state um, without recognizing that adequate testing is still not in place. I, I just don't get it. So I, I just want to ask folks, well, who are you going to look to? Who are you going to, since you like blaming folks for stuff, who are you going to blame when your grandmama gets sick or your dad or your uncle gets sick or your business doesn't get the kind of revenue stream because folks with common sense are staying home in the face of the facts, which tell them to stay home. <laughs> I don't understand it. I just, uh, you know, I don't know anyone that desperate to get a tattoo or have a drink at a bar. You know, I know a lot of folks stocked up their fridge and their basement with a lot of beer and booze. Um, and if you want to, if you're if that desperate, take a glass, go on the front porch and, and yell at a neighbor. But this is just crazy what people are doing uh, in the face of proving a point. Um, supporting, uh, you know, the lunacy of an administration that doesn't have a plan. Um, it's just saying open up because it's going to get better when. I don't understand it. I, it makes no sense to me. How do you weigh the economic drivers uh, that are pushing towards opening the economy because businesses have been stalled for two months and some won't recover versus the health of your employees? Um, sure, you can go back uh, to, to work. But under what conditions? You're not going to be able to fully staff up your restaurant or your business the way you did before because you're not going to be able to allow the number of patrons into your establishment um, because of distancing uh, regulations. And if you violate those regulations, then you are putting not just your business at risk from the, from the government coming in and shutting you down or fining you, but then most importantly you're serving as well as the people who work for you. So I get that there's a delicate balance there. So that's why it was so important, as you heard from the guests in your previous segment and from other officials around the country, 
to say that there's got to be a strategy that's based on some common sense facts about what we know and be and also reflective of what we don't still know about this virus. We have doctors out of Hopkins and elsewhere who are making notes that this virus is possibly transforming itself, is mutating. Children are now who once weren't getting sick are getting sick. So there's still a lot of variables here that I think if you're going to weigh the economy versus the health, I'm going to fall more down on the health side because you can always rebuild an economy. I don't think you can get much health back when you're dead. And so there's, that to me is a very stark reality. And it's a frustrating one, but it's a reality nonetheless. Yes, it is. But so then how are we going to get all these people back to work? Well, there is a new cruelty. Well, it's not a new cruelty, right? But it's a cruelty being implemented. And the person who said it best, Lawrence O'Donnell, a few, a few days ago, Actually, I think it was a couple weeks ago, and I, I, I had to find this, this clip. I really wanted to find it because when it came out, I, I wanted folks to understand that there are methods being used right now to force the least of us back to work, irrespective of what occurs. So check this out, and let's take this baby on the other side. Coronavirus is not the only cruelty America had to bear in April, Trumpism found new ways to express its cruelty. With meatpacking plants around the country becoming the new epicenters of coronavirus, with thousands of employees in those meatpacking plants testing positive for coronavirus, and with the death count in those meatpacking plants rising every day, Donald Trump finally used his powers under the Defense Production Act not to order the production of necessary medical order meat packing plants to stay open. The president did that at the exact moment when one worker lawsuit against one of the meat packing plants was making progress in federal court. The president's order might derail that lawsuit. Donald Trump was in effect ordering the workers in those meat packing plants to walk back into those buildings and risk their lives. And if any of them were thinking about deciding to stay home, Republican governors, in pure Trumpian style, issued direct threats to those workers, saying they would not be eligible for any unemployment benefits at all. If you don't walk into that plant, you get no money. Cruelty is not an accident in Trumpism. We have not seen cruelty like this in government and the workplace in the almost 100 years since Franklin Roosevelt, with the guidance of the first woman cabinet member, Frances Perkins, set this country on a steady march toward more and better worker safety and workers' rights. The cruelty that existed in the workplace in the 1920s was deliberate. And the Trump cruelty is deliberate now. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. That cruelty doesn't end we're trying to get people back to work. That cruelty also sh expresses itself in those who are working and trying not to give them their due, trying not to have them be able to move forward, trying not to do what's right by them, even though they have done what's right by us. So Rachel did a piece yesterday Love Rachel, and I think we ought, we ought to make sure to get our support to all these people that are out there really telling the truth, really out there expressing reality. Because that's the, when I talk about not believing in hope, but believing in action, when we look at O'Donnell, when we look at Rachel, when we look at several others, Many times I know they're bucking the system. They're taking it to the, lit, to the limit of the corporatocracy because they cannot be too hard on things that the corporate sector wants. So many times they themselves have to be careful as far as how deep they express the evil, if you will. But check out what she did last night. President Trump loves the military, right? President Trump loves the soldiers, right? President Trump is going to do what's necessary to take care of these guys. President Trump loves all these guys that are working to solve the coronavirus problem, to go ahead and be out there helping Americans to make sure that we do good. That's President Trump. 
Well, check this out and let's see if you think the same way about President Trump. Let's take it on the other side. If you want a nomination for the most excruciating Trump administration, self-defeating, cruel policy of the day, I commend to you this new reporting from Politico, which finally gets to the bottom of why it is that President Trump picked a random Wednesday in June as the day his order would expire that provides federal funding for the deployment of National Guard troops around the country to fight the epidemic. Roughly 40,000 National Guardsmen and Guardswomen are deployed right now around the U.S. It's the largest domestic deployment for the U.S. National Guard since Hurricane Katrina. And these National Guardsmen and Guardswomen, they're doing everything from you know, running community testing sites. They're doing that all over the country. They're providing emergency medical staffing in hard-hit prisons that have tons of cases. They have been running food banks and food distribution sites. They set up field hospitals. They've been dispatched by states like Massachusetts to basically run the state testing program for nursing home residents and staff. National Guard has been doing all of this work under an order from President Trump that allowed for this to be a federal deployment paid for by the federal government. Now, after the president did that in early March, a whole bunch of different members of Congress and senators and governors lobbied the president to please extend that authorization so these National Guard deployments could go right through till the fall and the federal government would continue to pay for them as a federal deployment. The White House would not agree to do that. But weirdly, they decided that they would extend it a little bit. They decided they would extend the federal deployment to June 24th, which is a random Wednesday in late June. Nobody could really figure out why they picked that day until somebody finally did the math. And as Politico.com reports today, um, we've now realize that if this thing ends on June 24th, that means that the federal deployment for these 40,000 National Guard troops will end at day 89 of that deployment. And ending on day 89 is really important because if their deployment had gone to day 90, if it had gone one more day, those National Guardsmen and women would have become eligible for some benefits toward their retirement and toward their education funding under the new GI Bill. So President Trump is cutting off their deployment. They're calling it a hard stop at day 89 of the federal deployment, specifically so they don't get their benefits. Thank you, National Guard. This is how your president thanks you. This is how the Trump administration wants you to know that you're valued and appreciated for your work. And not only do the guardsmen and guardswomen get screwed this way personally, but the states, of course, that are counting on all these folks to do all of this frontline work against coronavirus, the states are also gonna lose them all. I mean, that takes planning, that takes thought. Don't let anybody tell you the federal government is being slow or lazy or cumbersome here. They're nimble when they need to be, right? They're hard at work devising complicated systems like that to mess with the people who are actually putting themselves in danger and doing the hardest work to save American lives here. It takes a certain type of cruel. It takes a certain type of evil. These are people that are risking their lives. Some of these people would have gotten infected. Some of these people likely would have died. These people put their, their lives on the line. Is it too hard to ask us to make sure that they have benefits for us all taxpayers, for all the great work that they do, to ask to give them benefits, to ask to give them further education if that's what they, they want, if that's what they need. Is that too much to ask? After all the corporations, Trump has been giving trillions of dollars to them, but he likes to say he's for the common man. Now let's have a message to the common man. Let's have a message to the Trump supporter. Do you really think he cares about you? You are the ones who serve in the National Guard. You are the one who spill blood and go out there to fight for us. Do you really think he cares about you? Folks, election 2020, make the right choice. Absolutely make the right choice. Now, uh, this, uh, this other clip I want to remind you guys, there's this doctor that got the coronavirus. So for those people who think they're immune, it's okay to open up the economy. It's okay to listen to brother, brother Trump. We got to pity America if we fall for this. Because if doctors who know better, if doctors who try to protect themselves, if many like Maya Gay, the editor from the New York Times, who's a 33-year-old jogger, who, jogging, was not in contact with anybody that she knows of or that she can perceive of, could somehow get this virus, which means how contagious it is. Do we really listen to these guys who just want us to open up for 
for the sake of the corporate state as opposed to mitigating this, putting the economy on pause, and then going forward, pity America, pity America. So here we go with the doctor, and then after this we have one more, but these are important clips telling a story of where we are. Eventually we all have to go back to work, but let this be a lesson to you. Let me play this and then we'll take it on the other side. So today we learned a member of our own on-air medical team is sick with the coronavirus. Dr. Joseph Fair, he's a New York-based virologist who you have seen on this broadcast and others. We had Dr. Fair on our broadcast from New York, and I remember it because when he came out during the commercial break, he was the first person I encountered to decline, politely, a handshake. He explained that we had to stop doing that. And turns out he was right. And while he was always careful, now he is sick. Today Today, NBC News science contributor Joseph Fair posting the stunning news from his hospital bed that he's got COVID-19. I'm on the other end of it, but not out of the woods yet. Fair, a virologist, spent years in Africa studying some of the most deadly viruses known to man, including Ebola. Now the virus hunter believes he was infected with the coronavirus after traveling on a crowded plane two weeks ago to New Orleans. My flights were packed. And I had a mask on, I had gloves on, I did my normal wipes routine, but you know, obviously you can still get it through your eyes. Joseph first started noticing symptoms about three days after the flight. He lost his appetite, felt nauseous, and developed muscle aches. About six or seven days into that is probably when my lung infection developed because I started getting really short of breath. I really couldn't take a full breath. And that's when I decided to call 911 at first for me, <laughs> my first ambulance ride. At the hospital, he tested negative for COVID four separate times. Fair says it's most likely because he waited too long to get the test. The virus level's dropping at this stage of his recovery. He's now being treated with oxygen while his lungs heal. It's a surprising development for someone who'd been showing us how to protect ourselves in public places. Social distancing, using masks, cleaning your hands, not touching your face, and you still got the virus. I did do all those things. You know, occasionally you make a mistake, even people like me that do this for a living but I can't overtly remember one if I did make it. What's your message to people? Don't be in a hurry to open up. I know it seems like your life is over, but I mean, here, I mean you know me, John. I'm a uh, 42-year-old. I know we can get through this as a nation, but really, we have to take it seriously. This is a doctor, a virologist, somebody who's gone to Africa and worked with Ebola and all these other diseases. If he can get it, if he can make the mistakes to get it, it just tells you that unless we have good protocols established, unless we get this virus under control before we really send everybody back to work, we're in trouble. But, but here's the thing, right? Um, I, I think all the people in power who are trying to send you back to work, they already know that. They are seeking herd immunity brute force. In other words, they're saying we are willing to sacrifice about 3 to 5% of the population. And when I say sacrifice, I mean sacrifice 3 to 5% of the population, not only in the immediate debts. Let's say the debts are only uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.5% or whatever, but in the mitigating debts that's going to happen when you have overflowing emergency rooms, which will cause other debts for other reasons, there are a lot of things that will occur which has little to do with the coronavirus proper, but with other issues. And that is what they're driving at. They are willing to exchange economic activity for the disruption in the lives of those who are going to get the disease, those who are going to have not the best care. Because remember, if you're wealthy and the emergency rooms are filled up, you don't have to worry about anything because you have your private doctor, you have your system that can take care of you. But it's for those that are dependent on the system of our current screwed up healthcare system. They're the ones that are gonna suffer and we don't know who. And remember, it won't be only deaths by coronavirus, but it will also be deaths because coronavirus has taken so many of our resources that for other things, they just get laid by the side and again, those things can cause others to die as well. It's not time. We need a structure and we need leaders who are really working to mitigate this virus. Okay, folks, um, 
So that is pretty much the lineage that where I wanted to go with from pity to rationale, moving on. But I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't play the copulation that I did last, I think I did this one last night, uh, from our brother Steve Schmidt and his yet most harsh critique of the president, well-deserved that is, but I would be remiss if I didn't play this. So I want to play this. And for all of those, whether you like Trump or not, facts are a sticky thing. Facts mean so much. And when you hear him, uh, whether you're a supporter or not of the president, you can't help but say, yes, but. If you're a supporter and you say, but I still support, I ask you, to look into your child's eyes, to look into the eyes of those you claim or 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 propose to love, or those that you purport to love is the word I really meant. If after listening to this and knowing that it's factual, and you can look into the eyes of your loved ones, who this guy endangers, and you can still say, "Yeah, I support you." And I will vote for you just because of my one issue. Then, love ain't what love is supposed to be. Check this out. This one, I had to spend some time in doing some meticulous cut. But Steve Smith hit it on the money in the way he talked about Donald Trump from the beginning on to what he has done and how he has corrupted what is the presidency of the United States, the character of the United States, both locally and internationally. I tell you what, check out what Steve Schmidt has to say. When we look out at the whole spectrum of the nonsense that's communicated to the American people through the vast and sophisticated Trump propaganda network that's heavily influenced by misinformation that's intended to divide the American people, put into the social media sphere by hostile foreign intelligence services, it's a real threat to the comedy in our country. And so we've seen all of this play out over the course of this pandemic. We've seen a president President of the United States standing behind the podium with blazoned with the seal of the president, see, saying inject disinfectants, saying that I'm taking this malaria drug that could kill him. Over and over and over again, American people have been subjected to wave after wave of idiocy, of asininity, of misinformation from the president of the United States. And, and what it all adds up to is the most inept and incompetent response to a crisis that's conceivable to imagine. This is this is the worst response by an American leader, certainly by a president, but by any American leader in a time of testing and crisis in our nation's history. It's appallingly bad. And so as we talk right now, more Americans will be dead by the dawn. We're approaching 100,000 dead Americans because of the abject incompetence and mishandling of this by Donald Trump. And when you sit there and you look at Alex Jones and you look at Laura Ingram and Judge Janine and all of them. I mean, each and every one is in their own right spectacularly nuts that there are vulnerable people out there watching these people who make five, 10, 15, 20, 30 million dollars a year following their advice, endangering themselves. It's such a lethal con and fraud that's perpetrated by these people. Donald Trump is many things. He's dishonest. He's lied to the American people more than 17,000 times. He's completely corrupt. He's indecent. He's vile. He's divisive. But in this moment, the thing that matters the most, he's an imbecile. There's, there's no other word for it. That's the precise word we use in the English language to to describe his behavior. Most powerful person in the world who told the American people when there were 15 cases that this would be gone, it would disappear like it was magic, told the American people yeah. that the Chinese government was on top of this, told the American people the way you deal with this is maybe by injecting or consuming disinfectants. Every day has been the achievement of a new stratosphere of just abject idiocy flowing out from the White House. So it's the mis 
mismanagement of the crisis. And while that's going on, we see the continual assault on our democratic institutions, the undermining of the rule of law, the institutionalization of the corruption of this administration through the attorney general, the firing of the inspector generals, and on and on it goes. Our country, Chris, the most powerful country in the world, supposedly, economically, militarily, we are a basket case. We are at the center of this. You have more likelihood of dying yep. of this virus in the United States than any place else. You have more likelihood of catching it in the United States than any place else. You have more likelihood of not being able to get a test for it any place else. And so when we look at the totality of it, the mismanagement the incompetence, it's so epically bad that there's no comparison to it in the whole of American history. And what we have is 90 plus thousand dead Americans in an utterly shattered economy and a president who every day deliberately misinforms, spins, lies to the American people with one objective in mind. The guy will say anything if he believes it will help his reelection. The fundamental problem for Donald Trump is the man who said, I alone can fix it, I'm gonna make America great again, has presided over a period of suffering, of mass death, of disease, and economic devastation, the likes this country has never, ever seen in the entirety of its history. Again, everything stated by Steve Schmidt is quantifiable and verifiable. No doubt. So again, I make an absolute statement. If after listening to Steve Schmidt, if after verifying and quantifying what he has said, if after all of that is true, and you look at your loved ones and tell your loved ones you are willing for any particular one or two or three issues. He's going to get you the Supreme Court judges you want. He's going to destroy abortion or whatever lie you believe comes from him, that emanates from him that you can believe. If for some reason you looked at your loved ones and say, in as much as this is an accurate representation of who this man is, and you pull a, a lever for this guy. Remember, you would have been ultimately responsible for not only the demise of many of your loved ones, of many of the friends you claim to have loved, of many others in this country, but of the country proper itself. Because while one can have tunnel vision, one while one one while one can be fooling themselves for whatever reason. One cannot fool science. One cannot fool math. One cannot fool absolutism. So it's on you. It would be on you. So folks, I hope you enjoyed the show. But before I go, I got to do my thing. I got to ask you guys, those of you that are listening... Please remember that Politics Done Right is a program that needs your support. So I ask you so kindly to go to our store. You can see some of the things on the screens for those who are listening on the screen. What we have on the screen are our t-shirts, our cups, our books, and this one here, Class Warfare, the only, as I see it, Class Warfare, the only resort to right-wing doom. Please go to store.politicsdoneright.com, store.politicsdoneright.com, pick up a few of our books, give it out, gifts. Also have, I'm a, I, 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 yeah, I'm an activist, I'm behind a computer, yes, I go out in the fields as well, lose weight and be fit now, I've had to do that after going through a whole lot of stuff, so please go ahead, support the program at uh, store.politicsdoneright.com, but the best support, if you really want to sh ensure the longevity of what we do, and it's not only here behind the computer, it's also the blogs that we write, it's also the Facebook posts that we make. It's also the essays that we write for newspapers, for, on, for progressive sites throughout the country, because we have to saturate our domain with our message, 
That's the only way it gets out there. Right now, the right wing pays people all over the place to lie and put that information out. If I were a person hounding and looking for, oh, money at all costs, I could do what Candace does and would and go ahead and work for the right in as much as I know what the right wants, what the right is doing is dangerous for the country. It is dangerous for the well-being of the middle class and the poor. But they are willing to pay for that. They are willing for us to go out there and say whatever if we'll just write those articles and write those blog posts and post those messages to social media. I say no, but folks, we do need your support. So please, please, please become a supporter of Politics Done Right. Go to patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash politics done right. I just added it to the feed. Patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash politics done right. Support the program. Be a part of our family. Well, you're already, whether you support our program or not, I'll just be frank. That's just who we are. You are family. If you're listening to us, if you're sharing us, you are family. But we do need a portion of you to please come through for us and please support the show financially support allow us to be able to do this so go to patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash politics and right i repeat it a lot on even though you're seeing it on the screen and and in the feed folks because you know you have uh people that are listening to this only on podcast p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash politics done right or you can go to paypal paypal.me slash politics done right. I just put that on the screen as well. paypal.me slash politics done right. And of course, folks, go to our store, get a t-shirt, get a cup, get a label, get, get something. And you get a little something for supporting us or you can go ahead and be a member on screen. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. And you know how I end this, baby. I am what? Out! I'm Egberto Willis, host of Politics Done Right, an independent news program, a blogger at EgbertoWillis.com, a writer at several progressive sites, and the author of several books, including As I See It, Class Warfare, The Only Resort to Right-Wing Doom. I post several news videos of interest every day. I ask you so kindly to subscribe to my channel, and please leave me some comments. Thank you very much.